the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, my friends, Christmas is almost here. tiny advent stuffed inside the bigger advent like an advent turducken <laughs> or, or like some kind of Russian nesting doll. Like it's like the night before the exam you were supposed to study for all semester and now it's just you, some regret, a can of Red Bull, and a long, long night ahead. The fourth, the fourth candle of advent is like walking to the edge of a diving board at the city pool. Standing tall, looking down, standing a little less tall, measuring the distance to the water, a mix of trying to seem brave and having second thoughts. It's, it's the moment of truth. Or maybe the moment of going back down the ladder. Or wanting to go back down the ladder, but glancing casually over your shoulder and noticing that there are others in line behind you now. There's pressure to get it over with and have it look spectacular. Heck, even the gospel reading is pushing us forward, basically giving us a Christmas lesson today. Let the party begin! But not yet. I tow the board ambivalently. I want to be prepared. I want to get this right. I want to know how it all will go before I take the leap. But then again, does it make a difference? Where's the line? But, but between the Christmas hype and the fact that this day will ultimately be or ordinary in the ways that all days are ordinary. Maybe, maybe I can just go through the motions, not backing down the ladder exactly, but not springing into the unknown with too much enthusiasm either. Maybe that's it. I'll settle for a sort of bland obedience without any real expectations and so without any real disappointment. What's that, you ask? Am I ready? No. But then, I don't trust to know, I don't trust myself to know what that would mean. That's why I'm standing here at the edge of the board, perseverating, and, and not already mid-air, halfway through a twisting double somersault. I'm waiting for a green light, some assurance that, that I am ready, but I'm not sure who to look to for the sign of my readiness. And it's dizzying up here. The dizziness is familiar. I felt it before. This feeling of being all at once excited and not ready for a coming moment of celebration. Marriage felt this way. Are you ready? Was a question I knew better than to answer. How can you be ready for marriage? No one is given in, in advance the particulars of the promise that you promise on your wedding day. Having children felt this way. Ready for children? That's not even fair. It's multiple questions at once. There's the, the pregnancy itself, giving birth, and also every one of the endless numbered days that follow. Ready for that, please. For the cross-country move. To become empty nesters. For the, the trip off to college. For the audition you dreamed of for the phone call with a loved one in which you will finally, for the first time, risk the truth. For, for the decision to give one's life in love for others, to give one's life in a, a way, in a way you can't get back. Few of life's most profound moments wait for you to be ready for them before they come. We strive to be ready, but readiness can't be the requirement for moving forward because number one, we seldom are, and number two, for the truly transform transformational moments, sooner or later we realize that these moments are not really as much up to us as we thought. 
these moments when they find us, they're not rewards for our being ready. They are invitations that will, in God's good time, grow us into what they need us to be. Why should Christmas be different? We're mostly through four weeks of Advent, standing together on the edge of the birth, and we've been told by a man that needs bugs to prepare, to have ourselves ready, but we never are ready. And it's not all up to us. To say that we're not ready is not to give up hope. It's to acknowledge that Christmas will join us to a story so much bigger than ourselves. Other realities are converging on this moment. Even as we, we worship, even as we speak, heavenly hosts are making preparations independent of my lists and my shortcomings, my triumphs and my fears. Angel choirs rehearse their song for shepherds. Celestial lights delight to share a part. A star will lead the way. We are not left on our own. Crammed in that stall near the manger amid all the other unready, unhoping, self-doubting figures like me, there will still be more than room for the divine action called mercy, the divine word called grace. Christ's coming doesn't depend on our ability to grasp it or to get a handle on it. So here, perched as we are on the edge of the waiting of the miracle, Maybe the best last thing we can do before we jump off the board is name that this is a story beyond our control. Maybe the best last thing we can do in this moment is to remember that this season means to birth us out of certainty into wonder, and that this birth will be our gift. You could feel that shift, that birth taking place already last week in John the Baptist as he sat there in prison wondering if Jesus was the Messiah or if he should have held out for better, if he should have waited for another. Certainty into wonder. On the one hand, it looked a lot like the losing of his faith, almost despair. But what if, I wonder on the other hand, what, what if what, that was exactly the beginning of true faith for John? What if those honest questions alone in his cell somehow unlocked the door for John's certainty and enable his surrender to God, allowing God to be God apart from what John would have God be for the very first time. What if John's dark night is not the end of faith, but the hour of its dawning? You can feel that shift again today in Joseph, disappointed if not devastated at what he is certain is the unfaithfulness of Mary, committed to acting quietly and honorably in a way that will spare her life before an angels, angels in the dream invite him into wonder. It turns out his judgment of Mary was incomplete and premature. What he had perceived as unfaithfulness turns out to be the single great yes of the faith, one that will birth the world's salvation. Mary's peculiar faithfulness will birth Joseph's union and ours to a thing so much bigger even than his judgments of her. It wasn't just that Joseph grew that day his capacity for compassion. It's that God allowed him to see how he had been mistaken about where and in whom God might act beyond his ability to predict or imagine. And I know that experience. I know that experience of being mistaken about where and how and in whom God might act beyond my ability to imagine it. Like Joseph, like John, faith is inviting us now, we who stand on the back edge of Advent, out of certainty into wonder. We stick to what we know or think we know. You and I, we're 72 hours away from full bellies, much nostalgia, family either enjoyed or survived, and a few days off work. A bunch of football games with some carols thrown on top, you know, to, to decorate the exercise. But if we surrender what we know and enter like the Magi into wonder, bearing gifts for a king, bringing ourselves into unlikely spaces, willing to not know how the story goes from there, or where or in whom this Christ might delight, we may discover that the Magi were not the only ones with gifts that day. 
the baby bears gifts too. And the present of his presence, it means new life for all people. This presence, which is a light in the darkness, a light which we will rightly enjoy, and by which we will learn to see the world anew. This baby will give us the gift of new eyes. As the psalmist sings in Psalm 36, For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. Speaking of light, at a sunrise or sunset, the spectacular parts are generally in two directions. The event itself, the sun and the water, but also directly opposite the action, directly behind it, which is to say behind you as you're watching, on all that the light illumines. His presence will come as a light to enjoy and a light by which we will see the world more nearly as God does. I wonder, how does God see the world? Not with rose-colored glasses, surely, but with an eye for the redemption of what is broken and torn, with an eye that sees new possibilities, hope for the places and people about whom no one much speaks. His gaze is full of mercy for mending, for making whole, for healing, bringing together what has been torn apart. To be given eyes to see like him, it would be to be made partners of this repairing. Paul writes today in Romans that through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have received a gift. We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for the sake of his name. Apostleship, of course, is just a big word for sending. And that's God's gift, that he would send you and he would send me. Through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and the gift of being sent for the sake of occasioning faith in others, collecting a world of wandering individuals into a people who know they are loved, that they belong to God and one another. And even before the gift of that sending, we have received the gift of those God sent to us, those through whom we receive the light and new eyes of faith, the great cloud of witnesses. Together, we share the light that comes to us to enlighten all peoples, the light of the Savior living in us, full of grace and truth. What an unexpected gift, and a surprise on a road we can't pre predict because of the goodness of the Lord. Certainty and the wonder, new life as God's gift, eyes that see by the light of the one who came into darkness that the darkness could not overcome. If we are willing, the end of Advent will mean the beginning of an adventure. The baby comes to send us out into a world far beyond what we could ask or imagine. This baby comes to give us forgiveness, to make possible, impossible friendships. This baby means to give us friendships with one another and others. And my dear friends, look at this. This baby comes to give us friendship with God. Ready or not. Amen.